He's still in the mix. How old is he now? Mm, 34. Fact checking. Fact checking. Uh, he's 36. Oh, he's an old timer. Wow. Ah, Michael Woods. Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine Podcast. With me, as usual, is Matt Hansen. Matt, how are you doing? Really good. That was a very excited intro this time. Very excited. Well, I'm stoked because at long last, or after a very, very long break, Terry McCall is joining us. Mountain Bike Editor Terry McCall. Welcome, Terry. Hey, great to be back. Yes, all the way. He's joining us all the way from Victoria on Vancouver Island. And from what I see, it's it's a gray day in the background there, Terry. Always, always. <laughs> Until April, it'll be gray? <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. We are gathered together, the three of us, to discuss the year that was, 2022, in Canadian cycling. We are going to cover as many disciplines as we possibly can in the next... How are we, what are we shooting for? In the next 40 minutes to an hour, let's see how this turns out. Because we have a lot to cover. I, you know, I'm trying to remember what happened this year, and there was a lot of interesting stuff. Matt Hansen, I know you're going to have a hard time remembering what happened in 2022 because it didn't happen in the 90s. Oh, very funny. How long are you waiting to use that? You're going to, I'm going to christen you 90s, Matt. Okay, I like that. I like that. Listeners, Matt Hansen has... Uh, a ridiculously good recall of the 90s, mostly in cycling. Just, I don't know what happened last week, but the 90s, yeah, formative years. The n- <laughs> it was a hell of a ride. We're going to start, though, because we have Terry. We're going to start with Terry. Let's talk about some of the highlights in riser bar bikes and what happened on the world stage and here in Canada by Canadian athletes. Uh, where do you want to start? There's a lot to start with. Do you want to start with downhill? Um, yeah, there's so much to talk about this year that I will try not to talk too fast. Before we get to downhill, uh, Brett Reader won Red Bull Rampage for the second time. That was pretty awesome. But on the clock, the story was Finn Isles winning his first Elite World Cup. It was a storybook win happening at home at Mont St. Anne with his friends and family watching, and the Quebec crowd went totally crazy. It was amazing. In the younger categories, Gracie Hemstreet and Jackson Goldstone both won their World Cup series, so really exciting future for Canadian downhill. Uh, And then Goldstone showed that he's ready for the move up to elite next year by winning the notoriously burly Red Bull hardline against the pro men. Wild. I watched that hardline win, and that was bonkers. His skills are just mind-blowing. And so, I don't know. What do you think? When he moves up to elite, you know, sometimes the the transition there is like, yeah, yeah, you're you're smoking it in juniors, but, you know, you're going to have to work your way up the field in elite. Could Could he hit the ground running when he gets to the elite level? With the hardline win, I think he already has. I mean, it's hard to say because there's so many things changing with the World Cup this year uh, and that whole organization, but it should be exciting. And he's not alone either. Finales kind of came up with a smaller group of Canadians, but I mean, Tegan Cruz and Bodie Coombe were both on the World Cup podium with Goldstone this year. Tegan's older brother, Lucas Cruz, made a big jump up the elite standings, finishing 13th at the final World Cup. Like, the Canadians are showing up. It's awesome. Totally. And uh, I'm going to I'm going to sing your praises a bit here, Terry. Earlier in the year, you wrote a feature for the magazine exploring the idea of is are we in the midst of a golden age of downhill? And this was before a lot of these results. I think I can't remember if the story went to press before Finn Isles win at Mont Saint Anne. I can't remember now. Yeah, definitely. It was after uh, Hemstreet and Goldstone had won their first couple of World Cups this year, but um, Isles had a good start and then just kept getting better all year. He ended up finishing second overall behind Emery, which is amazing. You mentioned Gracie Hemstreet. She still has a team for next year, or she has the same team for next year, but there have been 
quite a few tumultuous things happening at Norco. We found out in October on a Friday, for me it was a Friday evening, that Norco Factory was stopping cross-country and downhill programs. But then by the end of November, we had, no, was it by the end of November or was it at the beginning of December we had downhill back on? It was beginning of December. Yeah, the Norco Factory team is back with a smaller downhill team than in the past. Gracie's back, as is Lucas Cruz, so that's awesome. And they still haven't announced the third rider on that team. But yeah, for cross country, a bunch of the issues that Molly Herford wrote about in her article are getting worse. The US Cup is smaller this year, so there's less domestic racing. Canada Cup cross country doesn't start until after the first two World Cups. And uh, Norco Factory cross country team, which has been a staple for years, is gone. There's rumors that other teams are contracting as well. So there's some rough times ahead for cross country, but there's also some awesome things happening. Uh, Emily Batty was back in the top 10, and that same weekend, Carter Woods won another World Cup. Uh, and there was some hugely impressive domestic and international races from Canada's juniors, uh, plus some more great results from Jen Jackson, the tireless Sandra Walter. And Getter Holmgren and then Bouchard, even Peter Desaire was back into the top 20 at one race this year. So mixed bag over there, but hopefully things get better in 2023. Yeah, it was kind of it was kind of a rough 2022. Also, with no uh, mountain bike squad going to Commonwealth Games, it just um, yeah things feel a bit rough at the moment in that discipline. Yeah, Commonwealth Games was weird timing, um, but it would have been awesome to see some of the younger riders there. Yeah, exactly. Take us to Enduro. Yeah, Enduro is exciting. Um, it's also joining the World Cup for 2023, so that'll be a big change. Um, but Canadians are carrying some huge momentum into that change. Jesse Melamed won the pro men's division, including a big win at home in Whistler. Uh, he's been on the verge of that win for several years now. It was amazing to watch it happen, uh, and he wasn't the only one. Vancouver Island's Emmy Lan won the under-21 women's overall in commanding fashion. I think she won every time she lined up for an individual EWS, which is nuts. She missed a couple of rounds due to injury, but that's an amazing record. And she still has more years in the under-21 category if she wants. Is she looking for a team right now because she was a Norco-supported athlete? Um, there's rumors that she might be moving. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Um, and those two weren't the only ones having an amazing year at the EWS. Reese Ferner, Jack Menzies, Remy Galvin, all were in the top 10 or on the podium at an EWS race. Canada has been good in EWS in the past, but right now they're looking amazing. Awesome. That is exciting. Oh, let's talk about Haley Smith. She, um, she was focusing on a lot of the Time Life Grand Prix stuff, and it paid off. Yeah, she focused on the Lifetime Grand Prix. <laughs> Sorry, Time Life. That's my CD collection. <laughs> she focused on the Lifetime Grand Prix this year, didn't she? Yeah, and that paid off. That was a big change for Haley, going from 90-minute um, cross-country World Cup races to like races that were almost nine hours, some of them. And for the first time racing gravel. Uh, but she ended up winning the Lifetime Grand Prix with its um, hefty prize purse. And she is back at that series in 2023. So that should be exciting. Yeah, 25 grand? Hmm, that ain't too shabby. Not bad at all. All right. With the mention of gravel, I'm going to go uh, curly bar for a bit here. I don't know. Where do we want to start on that end? We've got, um, well, one thing that's been at the, the forefront of my mind because this was a feature I wrote a few months ago, is Hugo Wool's Tour de France win. That is just uh, a crazy achievement. Yes, there's Steve Bauer before that. And we do. there are some other quote-unquote, they're not quote-unquote, there are some other Tour de France wins by Canadians. Ryder Hesedal was in a triple T. So was Swain Tuft, I believe. So, But anyway, this is an individual uh, win, and Hugo did it in stunning fashion with that solo breakaway. Um, Matt, you were glued to the TV? I think a lot of people were. I mean, the cool thing, too, is that we had Michael Woods there, so it was sort of like we were hedging our bets. But to watch, you know, it was a pretty thrilling finale there, and uh, we're kind of doing the math and hoping that, was it Jorgensen wasn't going to 
one up him. And then, of course, he crashed. And then we're still thinking he's not going to catch him. But yeah, that was a pretty amazing victory. I mean, for more reasons than one, as everyone knows. Yeah, yeah. With the the backstory about his brother, uh, how he, yeah, was gunning to get this win to dedicate for his brother who passed away 10 years ago, 10 years ago this month. That's the ultimate long game, I would say. And he won. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> Um, and then he still kept that form to the Tour of Norway, where he finished second in the general classification. Also, though, earlier in the year, he was the only rider from Israel Premier Tech to finish pairing Nice, as that team was just gutted with injuries and illness. I know, it's almost like a TV movie, right? Like there's one guy left. You know, it's just like the Bad News Bears or something like that. But that was pretty cool. A bit of foreshadowing there. What do you mean by that? Well... They seem to have lost their world tour status officially now. Oh, uh, yes. I was going to get to that. That is sort of um, the the bummer news that they are now a pro team, a Division Two team. I mean, outwardly, it seems like they're trucking along. A lot of returning riders. Uh, however, there's a few Canadians who are no longer on the roster, like uh, James Piccoli and Alex Catterford. But... Uh, well, we knew this earlier in the year. Derek G is going to be going from Israel Cycling Academy up to the the, the top team. In my notes, it says World Tour Scratch Out Pro Team. And he's going to be there for three years. That's his contract. And they'll still do lots of big races, obviously, right? And, and they might do other races by wildcard. We'll have to see. <sighs> yeah, I think they're wild cards, and uh, I need to dig into this a bit more, but I'm pretty sure their wild cards don't extend to, say, races like the Tour de France. But they're mostly UCI one-day races at the highest level. So uh, we'll see. We'll see where they end up and how they navigate this kind of a bummer of a situation. Yeah, it's just too bad that like they really seem to be building momentum this year and finally getting some wins and getting on their feet. And now it's a uh, detour, a little bit of a detour. I like that word. Yeah, for sure, a detour. On the other hand, they might actually get, I mean, at different levels of races. But, I mean, you know, the safe pro team races, they still intermingle with world tours. So, you know, the races aren't going to be a, a cakewalk, but they might have more wins this year than, than last year and sort of do a rebuild towards 20. When's the, when is the fiscal year end? And three years from now or whatever? It's a three-year cycle, yeah. That's the crazy part for me is that this, this it's not just like next year, it's three years that there'll be this. But anyway. It's a bit of time in the wilderness for sure. Woods was instrumental uh, at that stage win at the Tour de France. And Woods' season overall, I, I really, I'm really careful to say, or I would like to be really careful to say, because you look at the results sheet and it doesn't look, it's not as headline grabby as years before. But I'm always hesitant to say like, oh, he didn't have a good year because I don't know. His, his form might have been good at certain times, and, but things just weren't clicking. So to, to just look at those final results and give it a, a grade, A, B, or C, um, yeah, I'm a little hesitant to do that. He did have a win. It was a, a Root L'Occitanie, and that was in June. He was second in GC at Grand Camino. That was in February in Spain. And at the American Tour Classic, he was second behind his teammate, Jakob Fuglesang. So it wasn't, yeah, like I said, it wasn't a headline grabbing year in terms of his results, but he's still in the mix. How old is he now? Mm, 34. Fact checking. Fact checking. Uh, he's 36. Oh, he's an old timer. Wow. Ah, Michael Woods. I'm, I remember I, I had a, I was chatting with him and was musing, oh, will you, will you race Worlds in, in Montreal when it comes here? He's like, I'm no Valverde, man. I, I don't think I'll be racing then. <laughs> 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 All right. Also on the road, Maggie Cole's Lister. Holy jumping. She was winning everywhere this year. Criterium's in the U.S., road and Criterium national champion this year. And then on the track... Uh, let's see what we got. We got bronze at the Commonwealth Games Scratch Race, national champion in Omnium and Team Pursuit, and then over to the Track Champions League. She was third overall in the endurance category. And I think it just shows that there's going to be more and more big results, you know, because this is the kind of person all she's got to do is get to the finish line. And she even, she said, and not in a any way egotistical way, she's one of the fastest sprinters in North America. So just get her to the line. 
and she's got the race, just like the road nationals this year, you know, boom, no one has a chance with her. I think we'll see some big things in the next couple of years, bigger things. She seems to have had a roller coaster of a December. About two weeks ago, the team B&B Hotels KTM collapsed. This was the team that Montrealer Rafael Paricella was on. It was also going to have a women's squad for 2023, which was where Maggie Coles Lister was headed. The good news, though, is less than a week later, Zaf cycling team announced that Coles Lister would be on that Spanish team. We're hoping to find out more about how all that came about in the near future. Let's let's um let's stick with track for a bit, shall we? Yeah, uh, Mr. Bibic had a, a, a rainbow jersey, the scratch race, and the elite race. And I, I have to say, he's kind of like a Maggie too, right? He's got this unbelievable kick. I mean, you don't have a chance against this guy. So uh, that was pretty pretty impressive to see. And to see someone, I mean, of course, he won a junior world championship, which is nothing to sneeze at. But uh, to take it up one notch a year later after turning senior is uh, pretty impressive. For sure. And that got him an invite to the Champions League, uh, the UCI Track Champions League. Everybody loves a rainbow jersey. You mentioned his junior um, world championships jersey. His uh, partner in crime uh, back in his junior days was Carson Matern. Uh, you remember last year, Carson won the scratch race, uh, the world championship in the scratch race. This year, Carson Matern wins Omnium and Individual Pursuit. Can you imagine being his age and having now three rainbow jerseys? I mean, it's, it's what a future this kid's going to have. And he's just a motor. I mean, he, he also, one thing about Carson, which I love looking at, his position is just stunning you know such an aero position and i mean he's got the watts obviously but just he looks beautiful on a bike and on the track and this is this is something at the top of my mind because i recently spoke with uh matthias guimet he's uh, a rider from trois rivieres he's 21 years old he got an invite to the uci track champions league and i guess he was a bit of a it was a bit of a long shot but man did he make the most of it he told me that he prepared for it. Like he prepared for the first edition in Majorca where he was sixth in the scratch race and he won the elimination event. And then what he told me is like, you know, that was great. I was, I would have been happy with that. But then he realized, oh, I could get the leader's jersey in the endurance uh, standings. So he raced very strategically. And he, after the second edition of the Champions League, he, yeah, he took the leader's jersey. He, unfortunately, he lost it at the end of the third round, but um, yeah, he really made the most of that. And there was one race, I forget the race, but he and uh, Dylan Bibic were just off the front. And they were just, you know, trying stuff and racing and having fun. Um, unfortunately, that move got shut down. But um, yeah, that was actually some good racing over there. I think it's a good testament, too, to how, you know, if you build it, they will come with the, th- you know, we're going to have three world-class tracks in in canada soon alberta and ontario and quebec and i think you're going to see even more more bibics and more matterns more maggies you know i think in the future because it's the more riders get out there and you find those world champions if you never have these guys ride the track you're never going to see who's you know got the potential so stay tuned yeah no that's a big deal the bromont track which um was just relaunched if you will reopened in i think it was october was the official relaunch that's beautiful yeah i've heard i've heard that yeah it's just stunning and where was the original bromont track from atlanta yes it was atlanta this was a story i heard recently it it was in atlanta then it ended up in a disney warehouse and pierre utsubo who People are familiar with his name. He's a, he's coached many Canadian riders. He, um, I forget what role he had. Oh, he was he was at, with Cycling Canada at the time or the CCA. He called up a Disney vice president and said, "This is the story he told me. I hear you have a track. Would you like to sell it?" And the 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 Disney exec said, "Yeah, give me a price." To which Utsubo said, uh, "It was." Two hundred and five thousand dollars, and I was like, two hundred and five thousand dollars. He's like, yeah, I, I was worried someone offered two hundred thousand dollars, so I added five thousand dollars extra. <laughs> there you go. That's the Bromont track. It was a nice track for a long time too. Well, and I've heard the the, the new one still has the same sort of bones, same sort of banking, same sort of structure. Uh, so it's still got a bit of Atlanta in there. 
See, I'm not going to talk about the 90s. I could talk about the 2000 Pursuit Finals, but I'm not going to because he said not to talk about the past. Terry, I apologize. That's my fault. I'm the one who started bringing up the 90s. I don't want to be... I'm not 90s Matt. He's 90s Matt. Terry, we have a new star uh, in paracycling. Um, yeah, yeah, we do. Uh, Mel Pemble, who's uh, riding out of my hometown here in Victoria, BC. Yeah, she won two world championships in her first appearance at Paratrack Worlds. That was in Omnium and the Scratch Race, and she set a world record in the Flying 200. Uh, so that's a pretty amazing start. Bam, there you go. She comes out swinging. I wanted to say something. Uh, something I'm, I'm really excited about is kind of like seeing the next generation of everyone. And for me personally, you know, seeing last names of guys um, and girls that are, are coming up to the, to the system doing great. Ashlyn Berry, Michael son, Gavin Hatfield, Tim Hatfield son, the, the whole Holmgren family, um, Tyler Orshell, all these people are, are, you know, uh, young people that I knew their parents. And I think that's just so cool to see this next generation of, of cyclists from, from people that I knew in the old days. And, uh, you know, they have great, obviously they have great genes, but they also have great support systems. So that's, that's exciting for me to watch that. Yeah, and we'll get a chance to watch that pretty soon in 2023 when the Cross World Championships happen. And we saw some amazing results from the Holmgrens as well as others at National Championships, at Pan Ams, at the North American World Cups. We have to give a shout out to Ava too for, you know, uh, racing up a level and, and beating all the elites. I mean, that was that was pretty great. I mean, she took a ch- well, I don't know if she took a chance. Maybe she knew she was going to win, but I thought that was uh, pretty awesome to see. Yeah, that was at the the national championship race. She she raced up into the elite women's category. It'd be actually cool to see Ian Ackert to see how he's going to do this year at the Worlds. You know, hopefully he won't have incidents like last year, and to see how he how he rides because he's a he's a bit of a talent too. A bit of a talent. He's a hell of a talent. I love your understatement. <laughs> he's pretty good. <laughs> Not bad. <laughs> Early in the season, I'm like I'm looking at results and seeing like names like. Tyler Clark, Brody Sanderson, um, and uh, Tyler Orschel, and, and then I, I'm like, what? What are what are they doing? They're 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 under twenty threes, and I'm like, oh yeah, that was three years ago in in 2019 when they were U twenty threes, and yeah, they are they're all doing super good. I think that's what needs too is that when you think about the cross nationals, which weren't around for the last three years, basically. All of these guys who, you know, usurp the reigning champion, Michael Vandenham, they've grown up. You know, do you think about the gains you make from 17 to 19 as a, as a young man or woman, um, physiologically. Uh, and, of course, they're training as much as they can, racing when they can. Uh, the last three years of this pandemic sort of seems like one big year. But for these kids, I mean, this has been a huge uh, time to make gains just by growing up. Also, for me, uh, it's notable uh, Sydney McGill's performances. She's been yeah, just steadily improving. Uh, just recently, she was eighth at the Dublin World Cup, which was pretty cool. She was second at Pan Am. And she was, she's always been a strong cyclocross racer. I think under 23, she has two national championships. I'm trying to remember there. But um, yeah, it's good to see her still improving, still racing well. And it looks like Magali is sort of on the mend here, and she's been racing at the one run below the World Cups. But I think she's she's about to start the World Cups again. I think it's gonna be awesome to see the two of them duking. Like to see two Canadians up in the top ten at a World Cup uh, duking it out is gonna be pretty pretty cool. Oh, we forgot, we forgot something. We forgot something. I've prepared all of my local midweek results to go over from April to August. So when do you want to put that in the program? So. These are your results from doing your your races, your weekly races in um, in an industrial park. So I'll just start with the first one. We'll go through each one with details. We'll probably need about five minutes per race, so we should just make time for that. Oh, and I, and I shouldn't say industrial park. Maybe it's like a corporate corporate campusy park. How would you describe it? Yeah, I don't know, man. I just I'm just looking at the wheel ahead of me, trying to hang on. This is a great transition from the next generation of people like aiming for worlds to uh, a Toronto Industrial Park Masters race. I like it. Well, then, I think that's where we end our recap of 2022. But we didn't get to the races, though. Gentlemen, thank you very much for this discussion. It was great. And you know what? I'm looking forward to 2023. And I'm looking 
forward to roping Terry into more of these. It's been too long, Terry. We missed you. I'm thrilled at the prospect. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, May 3rd, I started at the A group. That was a mistake. I might have got dropped for about seven minutes. And then the next week, uh, I was doing the B race, and that was a little better, although I still suffered. Um, but we'll talk about that for a while. I've got all of my metrics here. We can break it down, what I did wrong. And that's the episode. It is written and edited by me. Well, I didn't do much writing in this one. This was pretty uh, freeform. Uh, thank you, Matt Hansen, for your insights. You're welcome. And thank you, Terry. Great to be here. <laughs> was that too sarcastic? <laughs> I meant to mean that one. <laughs> Yeah, thanks for having me. It was good to be back. I think the last time I was on the podcast was this episode last year. <sighs> ah, this episode is produced by Adam Killick. He does the music too. Thank you, Adam. Also, thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And thank you, listeners, for tuning in. Please rate and review the show, Ride Safely, and we'll talk to you next year. <laughs> <laughs>